Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Pastor Greg Pog, and I welcome you to Christ Church. What a nice crowd today, and uh, welcome to all those who are watching online as well. It's a beautiful morning. We're glad that you're here to worship, and uh, we just hope that you feel right at home. Now, isn't this a sign of the times right here? The mask <laughs> hanging from the, from the uh, music stand. So uh, let's all stand and begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it's good to be here. And uh, Lord, these are unique times, challenging times in many ways, but we press on because we serve an awesome God. And we know that you are at work in the world right now in ways that even go unseen. But uh, we call upon your Holy Spirit to come and move among us today. Fill our hearts with your love, with your peace, with your presence. Lord, whatever needs people have walked through the door with in their hearts, I pray that you minister to them powerfully today. Lord, bless people to know that you are with them, that you are guiding them, that you are leading them. And so we invite the presence of your Holy Spirit right now as we worship and as we hear from your word and, and as we celebrate a baptism. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Breaks the power of sin in darkness. Let's sing it out. Who breaks the power of sin in darkness? His love is mighty, He's so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes, shakes the whole earth, the holy thunder.
sing a new song this morning. It's about God's amazing power that nothing is impossible with him. Like in Ezekiel, he turned the bones into an army. And how that God will meet us where we're at. We thank you, God. And I search the world. Oh, 
is nothing Oh, this is nothing Better than you, Lord This is nothing Better than you, Lord This is nothing Nothing is better than you So now again Oh, this is nothing It's better than you, Lord This is nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. He's the God of the mountains. He's the God of the valley. There's not a place where seeking grace won't find me. We thank you for that mercy, that grace, God. That love that chases us down. Oh, the love of the Father. We worship you, God. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out
us to draw deep in our hearts, in our souls, and pour out our praise, Lord. You love the praise of your children. That's what worth, worship is all about. It's declaring the worth of God. It's pouring out our praise to him. May we be a church that is full of praise to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's children said, amen and amen. You may be seated. Let's have the lights up a little bit, please. And it's my pleasure to welcome Robert Johnston and Madison Mackey as they present their son, James Paul Johnston, for holy baptism. You can come up at this time. And their sponsors are Hillary Hutner, Janelle Lenz, Eric Johnson, and Josh Pelkey. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to you. <coughs> Got to balance things out here, right? In the Great Commission of Matthew 28, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So today we are celebrating the sacrament of baptism in obedience to this command and according to God's word. In Acts chapter 2, the Apostle Peter shared the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. His message included these words. He said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom our God will call. And so the waters of baptism remind us that Jesus desires to wash away our sins. His promises of unconditional love and forgiveness are the beginning of what we pray will be a lifelong relationship of faith for James. The Apostles' Creed is an expression of this faith in which we baptize. I invite the congregation to stand and join with us as we confess our faith together. And you may turn and face the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. In 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul says, For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. And so today we welcome James into the body of Christ. As parents, as sponsors, and as the whole family of God, we promise to love and support him in his journey of faith. And so I especially ask our parents and godparents right now, do you promise to demonstrate an authentic Christian faith to your child or godchild? Will you bring him to worship and Christian ed education? Will you teach him God's word and by your example show him the way to a personal relationship of faith in Jesus Christ? If so, please answer as a group, I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. Ask God to help and guide me. There we go. James Paul Johnston, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. 
Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Well, through this sacrament of holy baptism, we celebrate the spiritual rebirth that comes by the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us. And we pray that as James is baptized today, he will continue to grow into a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so today, Pastor Sean is lighting a baptismal candle that we want to present you as a reminder of Jesus, the light of the world. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus told his followers, You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. May the light of Jesus continue to shine brightly through all of our lives so that others may come to know that Jesus is Lord. And let's conclude with prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this family today, the, all the loved ones that are here to celebrate this special day, and we lift up James to you, Lord, and we ask you to bless him in every way, Lord. He's such a beautiful little boy, and we ask that as he grows in years, he would just come to know your love and understand it and accept it and walk in it, and Lord, that his life would be blessed as a child of God. Keep him safe in all that he does. Bless his parents loved ones as well. We lift him up to you this morning and celebrate this baptism in Jesus' name. Amen. You can blow out your candle, Robert. And I'm going to give you all of these, Hillary, and you can hand them out. By the way, this young lady is getting married here in about two weeks, so <laughs> to that guy over there. Yeah. So congratulations, let me show him off a little bit here. I don't know how James is liking this dress he's wearing today, but <laughs> he looks good. It's a family, family tradition. There he is. What a beautiful little guy. Take a good look at him over here. Can you see all those people out there? Yeah. Let's express our love to this family, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. You can go back to your seats. Well, good morning again, and welcome to Christ Church, everyone. So good to see you, and uh, what a joy to celebrate a baptism once again here in our worship center. I've got a question for you as I begin this morning. Do you know the names of these people? David Emerson, Linda Carroll, Catherine Allen, William Morris, Jerika Laws, Jennifer Cahill. Anybody recognize any of those names? Huh? No, not authors. <laughs> Good guess, though. If you do recognize their names, you should call the FBI because they're all on the missing persons list. <laughs> During 2019, if you can believe it, there were a total of 609,000 missing person reports filed with the FBI all across the United States. And 35% of those were youth 18 years of age or younger. Now, most of these people were found, praise God, but there are still 87,500 people missing, missing persons records in the United States that have never been found and many never will be found. You know, when something is lost, we like to find it, don't we? Especially people. And so when we think of that number, 87,500, think how many more thousands and thousands of people are still desperately searching for those that are lost. You know, I was thinking about it this week, and I would say there are three kinds of being lost. One is physically, of course. Have you ever been lost? It's not a good feeling. Even when Colleen and I are shopping at Kohl's, and she goes one way and I go another, and then I lose her, and I end up walking miles around the store just trying to find my own wife because she never keeps her phone on, you know, that's not a good feeling of being lost even at Kohl's, right? 
But I remember a time many years ago now when our firstborn, Matt, was two years old. We were serving a church in Fairfax, Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C., and we were shopping with little Matt one day at the Springfield Mall, which is a big mall, you know, kind of like a Rosedale or a Ridgedale or whatever. And um, I was looking at some sport coats in a men's store. And Matt was working his way in and out of all these clothing racks, and all of a sudden he was gone, two years old. Well, we just panicked because at that time, a lot of kids were being kidnapped in the malls. And they were actually taking kids like into the bathroom, shaving their heads, putting different clothes on them, taking them out of stores, never to be found again. So, I mean, our hearts just started pounding. All of a sudden, little Matt was gone. So we reported this right away to the, to the head store clerk there in this men's store. They called the mall security, and in a matter of a couple of minutes, every outside door to the whole Springfield Mall was locked down, and they began searching for Matt. Well, about five minutes later, that little stinker had walked somehow. We'll never know how it happened. The equivalent of from one main store all the way down to the center and all the way down to another store. We got a call that he was sitting on the lap of uh, somebody out in front of Macy's. And so we go running down there, and uh, here's Matt. And I picked him up, and I gave him a big hug, and then I swatted him on the rear end and said, Don't you ever run away again. But I'll tell you, that's something you never forget, right? Because lost people matter. So we can be lost physically. You know what? We can also be lost emotionally. We think of how many people even right now are struggling with depression, with uh, mental illness, with just a lack of hope, a loss of hope, frustration with things that are going on in the world right now, and they feel emotionally distraught, and they sometimes even feel lost. And then, of course, we can be spiritually lost. Many people are far away from God today because some haven't heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus' love, and uh, others have heard it and have rejected it. Now, right now, there are 331 million people in the United States. Did you know that? That's what the uh, 2020 census is predicting. That's about where they're going to land, 331 million and it's said that 62% or 205 million in the United States identify as Christians. And that's the largest Christian population in the world in any one country. But that means that at least 126 million people in the United States are lost spiritually. If you believe Jesus' words in John 14, 6, where he said, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Did you know that Jesus himself said there are not many roads to heaven? There are not many different religions that will work. There's only one. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. If that's true, that means there are a lot of lost people as our neighbors, co-workers, and friends. But there's good news. Because in Luke 19.10, a wonderful verse in the Bible, Jesus said, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that means everything that was lost. As, as we've shared here many times before at Christ Church, Jesus came for people, yes, but he also came to redeem the whole world and everything in it. Institutions, meaning business, education, government, the church. He came to redeem culture. And society, he came to reach states and nations. But Jesus has a special place in his heart for people. And so there are three wonderful little stories in the Bible that I want to highlight for you before, and or today. And they're called parables, but they're found in Luke chapter 15. And the first is the story of a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. And one of those sheep got lost. And it says that that shepherd left the 99 and went searching for that one lost sheep until that sheep was found. And he was so excited about finding his lost sheep that he called all his friends and said, Rejoice with me, because my one sheep that was lost has been found. And Jesus said there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents and is found than over 99 who don't think they need to repent. 
And then the second story in Luke 15 is that of a lost coin. A woman had 10 silver coins, and the Bible story says she lost one of them. She lit a lamp. She began to search her whole house from corner to corner. She swept out under everything she could, looked in every cupboard until she found that lost coin. And then she called her friends and she said, Rejoice because I found my coin that was lost. And Jesus said, Even the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who was lost and is now found. And then there's that wonderful story that we call the story of the prodigal son. This is all in Luke chapter 15. And you remember there was a father who had two sons. And the youngest of his sons must have been a little rebellious because he said, I want my inheritance now. And for some reason, probably against his better judgment, his dad said, okay, I'll give you your, your, your inheritance now. And the Bible story says that basically that young man went off to a foreign country and blew his money on wine, women, and song. And one day he found himself out of money, all alone, and getting pretty hungry. So he had to literally go become an indentured servant to a man, probably a wealthy man who could afford servants. And of all things that would disgrace a young Jewish boy, he was sent out into the field to feed the pigs. Not exactly a kosher job, right? Well, he's there feeding these pigs and wishing that he could even eat the food that the pigs are eating. And he comes to his senses. And he says, God, I have really blown it. I could, my dad's servants are treated, treated better than I'm being treated here. So he made a commitment in his heart to go home, to repent to his father, and ask for his forgiveness. And you know, as he even came walking down the dirt road, as I picture it, to his father's farm, his father saw him off at a distance and had compassion on him and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and welcomed him home. And not only that, he called his servants and said, bring the finest robe, bring my ring, which signified, you know, belonging to that family. Bring a new pair of sandals and kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party because my son who was dead, as good as dead, is alive. My son who was lost has been found. What a profound illustration of our Father God's love for lost people, amen? Just a, a powerful story, and that's why we, we love it so much. So I want to share three keys to reaching the lost, because that's what we're each called to do in Jesus' name. And the first is to have compassion. You know, the father of that prodigal had compassion. And people who are lost, for one reason or another, need compassion of those who have been found. Are you found today in Christ? Then you're called to have the compassion of our Heavenly Father for those who are still lost. And that means setting aside our pride, setting aside you know, issues that we may have with other people, to learn to love people like God our Father loves people. You know, there's a wonderful little paragraph in the Bible where it says that one day Jesus was, was um, sitting outside Jerusalem. And I picture him, you know, looking down at the city, this holy city. But it says that he had tears and he had compassion because he saw the people in that city as harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That's kind of an allusion back to that story in Luke 15, isn't it? Of the shepherd going after the one lost one. Jesus looked at the people in that city and saw them as harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And that's the city that Jesus eventually walked into where he gave his life for us on the cross. I think that's a pretty apt description of many of our cities today, don't you? People everywhere today look like sheep that are harassed and helpless and are wondering, who's my shepherd? Who can I trust in life? Who will, who will uh, tell me the truth? Who will lead me in a good way? Compassion is, is a key. To put yourself in other people's places and to ask, what are they feeling? How can I feel what they're feeling? And then how can I respond to their needs? Another key to reaching the lost is sacrifice. 
I mean, that shepherd had to sacrifice something to go after that one sheep because what if a wolf had come and attacked the other 99? I mean, he put the whole flock at risk to go after the one. There's some sacrifice needed in our lives to go after our family, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors. What will they think of us? What will they say about us? If we speak up and share a testimony for Jesus Christ, will they be uh, turned off? Will they reject us on Facebook? It's happened more than once, hasn't it? So um, there's sacrifice involved. That woman, she had to sacrifice some time and effort to go to work, to turn her whole house upside down to find that lost coin. And of course, I think of that, that son and father in the parable of the prodigal son. Both of them had to, had to do some work to build that relationship, to build that trust back to where it was before. They both had to set aside their pride. They both had to, to uh, you know, be willing to, to start again. And isn't that often true in life? It takes sacrifice to reach those who are lost, and it takes time and work and resources. And so there's a commitment here to seek and to save the lost. Our Jesus made that commitment all the way to the cross. And then another key to reaching the lost that I see in these stories especially is persistence. I want to share an example of uh, persistence that I see in one of my loved ones. It's my mother-in-law, Doreen Shabrowski. Uh, that's my wife's mother. She's 90 years old. We just had a 90th birthday party for her this past year. And uh, she's been pretty well cooped up in her senior complex down in Shoreview for the last five months and she loves the North Shore. So this week Colleen and I took her with us with our camping trailer just intentionally to go up to the North Shore to get Doreen some fresh air. And we spend most of our time just sitting there on the hillside looking out over Lake Superior, had some great campfires, had a lot of great conversation and she was she was really blessed. But I'll tell you about Doreen. Not only does she love the Lord, but she loves the lost. She keeps, a, she keeps a, a list of names of people that she's praying for who don't know Jesus or have drifted away from Jesus. And every morning, she's praying for that list, name by name, saying, Lord, touch their lives, you know, minister to them, reveal yourself to them, draw them close. And she prays in the morning specifically, and she prays in the evening before she goes to bed. And those prayers are being answered. And uh, recently, she bought a, a new book by Max Licato, which I've read and I would recommend to you. It's simply called Jesus. It's so readable. Many of you know that author, Max Licato. And she sent one of these books to every member of our family. And she asked everyone to read it. She just said, it's been a real blessing to me. It really has made Jesus more alive and personal in my life, and I would love to have you read it too. But you know why she did that? Because she doesn't want to see any member of our family reach the end of their life and not know that Jesus is their Savior. And so 90 years old, and this is still her, her mission. I think that's a mission that we could all take on as our own. Who's someone that you care enough about to be compassionate toward? to sacrifice for, to be persistent with over sometimes many years. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Why? Because people matter. People matter. Has he filled your heart with that same passion and commitment? Well, yesterday I was on a Zoom call with about 80 Christian leaders from around the globe. It's an amazing technology, isn't it? And uh, when you can see the faces and hear the voices of people in the Philippines, in Africa, in Hawaii, in South America, in Argentina, in Canada, it's just wonderful. And we had a beautiful call with Dr. Ed Silvoso, who you know has been my mentor and friend for more than 25 years, the leader of Transform Our World. And uh, it was a call about this challenge that I've been lifting up to you these last couple weeks called One Million ecclesias or one million tangible expressions of the church starting in our home because we all know the church isn't the building it's the people and wherever two or three gather in Jesus name he's promised that he will be there and so we're 
calling each of you to rededicate your homes uh, as ecclesias, as expressions of the church, and then to be reaching out to your neighbors and friends because lost people matter. So this week, an email blast went out and a Facebook posting sharing this challenge with about 4,000 of our Bless Minnesota partners across the state. And with a boost on Facebook, we hope to reach 75 to 100,000 people this week. And then we're praying that they too will be inspired to share this with their circles. So this morning as I conclude, I want to offer this challenge to you again. Because lost people matter. And because these are urgent times for Christians to rise up and to reach out with that love and compassion, with that sacrifice and persistence. This is the video that Andrew and I produced that has gone out with this message. I'd like you to watch it, and then I'd like you to go to Facebook, Ecclesia Everywhere, and join the group, become a part of this movement, but most of all, to act upon it right now, to be that shepherd who will go after the lost sheep, to be that woman who will go after that lost coin, to be that father who will run and throw his arms around a lost son. Let's watch and then we'll pray together. Hello, fellow Minnesotans and blessed Minnesota friends and partners all across this beautiful state. I'm Pastor Greg Pog and I have an important message to share with you today. While both our state and nation continue to experience an unprecedented level of uncertainty, fear, violence, and concern for the future, there are tangible steps that you can take right now to help make a positive change. Bless Minnesota is partnering with Transform Our World to invite individuals, churches, and ministries throughout the state and nation to establish one million ecclesias starting in the home. Ecclesia is the Greek word translated church in the Bible, but it's not the building, it's the people. In Matthew 18, 20, Jesus said that wherever two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. So here's the challenge I'm lifting up for every Christian in Minnesota. Number one, begin by realizing that you are the church and that God desires to use you right where you're at, beginning in your home, whatever that looks like for you. Number two, dedicate your home as an ecclesia, a tangible expression of the church, where two or three or more gather daily in Jesus' name. Open the front door and say, Jesus, I or we invite your love, presence, and power to invade this space and become the center of everything we say and do. Consider even taking a step beyond by dedicating all your doors, TVs, computers, and phones as pathways of blessing. Many of you have already done this, but I'm asking you to be intentional about doing it right now for such a time as this. And number three, adopt your neighbors in prayer. You see, when you begin with prayer, the Holy Spirit will lead you to action. Activate the authority you have in Jesus to bless instead of curse, to build meaningful relationships instead of isolating, to respond to the felt needs of others, knowing that in the process, God will open the door for you to also minister to their deeper needs. It's when we do these things first that hearts are softened and people are receptive to the good news of Jesus Christ, the message of salvation and new life in Him. People are hurting right now. Many are fearful and struggling, out of work and out of hope. Others are angry and frustrated and we see these emotions being acted out all over our state and nation. From COVID-19 fears to racial unrest, from protest and rioting to lawlessness and murder, from political gridlock to the potential for social anarchy. These are critical days for the future of the United States. We must rise up as Christians and pray and respond with the opposite spirit of love and peace and appropriate action. Together we can change the spiritual climate in Minnesota and help move this state and nation forward in a positive way. It starts with us. To be counted as part of the One Million Ecclesias, go to Facebook, Ecclesia Everywhere. 
and register your home as an Ecclesia. Doing so will be your way of saying, I'm all in, and it'll help us mark the progress of this shared national goal. I assure you that your information will not be shared with others or used for solicitation in any form. And if you have an extra few minutes, please watch the inspiring five minute video that you will also see there from Dr. Ed Silvoso, the visionary leader of Transform Our World. Friends, Bless Minnesota has a motto. It's go beyond nice. Minnesotans are known for being friendly and outgoing and truly welcoming of all people. We call it Minnesota nice. But right now, this is about so much more than just being nice. This One Million Ecclesias initiative is about claiming the presence and power of Jesus to change the spiritual climate in our homes, neighborhoods, communities, state and nation. And every one of us who names the name of Jesus is being asked to join this movement and together make a difference. So let's recognize that we are the church. Let's declare our homes to be an ecclesia of Jesus' presence and power, and let's adopt our neighbors in prayer. These things are foundational. The Holy Spirit will lead us forward from there, and we will see injustice turn to justice, anger turn to peace, and hatred turn to love. God is so faithful, and He will do it, but how wonderful that He has chosen to do it through us. Thank you, and God bless you. Let's stand together. Yes, God, you are faithful. And we know that you could just wave your hand and every issue that we see in society today would be gone. But you've filled us with your spirit. You've sent us out into the world to be your representatives. You've sent us to go after those who are lost and to love them into the kingdom. And so, Lord, fill us today with a fresh fire to be your representatives in this world. As we go out these doors this morning, and even now, Lord, put on our hearts the names of people and places that are lost physically, emotionally, spiritually, and send us out there to find them. Use us, Lord, each one of us, starting in our homes, with our own families and circles of friends and loved ones, but take us farther than that. Open our eyes to see the needs of our neighbors, our co-workers, our classmates. Help us, Lord, to turn the tide right now back to God. That what began as a curse in Minnesota will become a blessing that will touch the whole nation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. as you leave today so you can just drop your offering in there and also your connection card we love to stay connected that's one small way we can stay connected if you fill out that card and drop it in there with prayer requests or any other sort of information you want to share also next week we will be worshiping outside like we did a few weeks ago you may have seen in, in the newsletter or in Pastor Greg's email that we're going to be trying to do that about every other week, weather permitting. So inside one week, outside the next week. And so next week, be prepared to be outside.